Um, the title of my sermonette today is Death is Not to be Feared. I thought of calling this Death Defying, but uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell was talking about walking the tightrope a few weeks ago, and that would be Death Defying. This is not. But death is never an easy subject to discuss, either our own or that of a beloved family member. People don't like to prepare wills and make plans for that, that time, although I'm certainly finding there are a few crematories that have my address now, and obviously they are aware of my age, is that we keep getting the little flyers in the mail, special offers. Um, and there are videos now made by people who um, are, are doing funeral services in a different way, attempting to transform the planning uh, and the pain that's typically associated, as, and also the fear that surrounds death uh, for people. For those who believe in the true living God and His Son, our Savior, death should really have a different meaning, a far different meaning than what this world generally promotes and would like us to believe. And uh, and I have more to say on that in a little bit, but I want to really jump first into the Bible so we can look for the truth. And I'm going to I'm going to be in in uh, uh, reading from the new Inter new Inter international version. I'm going to be in John for a bit. You don't necessarily need to turn here. You can kind of settle in because I'm I'm going to read this to you. But it's John uh, chapter 11 and really verses one through 25. So as I say, we're going to be here for a little bit. But it's the, the story of Lazarus, which everyone is quite familiar with, but uh, thinking about this in a little bit of a different way as we get into it. So beginning in, uh, in verse 1, John 11, verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. Uh, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And then continuing in verse 4, when he heard this, Jesus said, and this is quite amazing, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And obviously this was quite a bit part of his plan. And then he said to his disciples, this is in, in verse 7, let us go back to Judea. And continuing on now, we're reading, we're jumping down to verse 11. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So again, you're starting to get the sense that Jesus tarried for a very specific reason to make a very specific point on his arrival at the home. And then re continuing in verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Now, we're continuing on in verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. In, chapter, in verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. In verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. 
And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus challenges the family here and all of us today. He used the death of Lazarus, Lazarus, one of his close friends, to make a point with his disciples. Now, he does not raise up each of the dead at the time of their death, and as in the case of Lazarus, as he did, but he makes a promise to us, and Martha understood in her initial response to the question Jesus posed to her. She knew exactly what he, what he was asking. Jesus had a deeper point to make, and for all of us later to understand, to come to understand, that death holds no sway over his plan for us. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, will live. This verse from John, in so many ways, sets apart our faith, our beliefs, that believing in the risen Jesus Christ as the Savior and following his commandments can lead us to life beyond this mortal shell that we have, this painful mortal shell. Now, this is read, this, this verse is read at so many Christian burial services around the world, so many different denominations. One can consider this to be perhaps the gold standard for comfort at a, what is considered to be a terrible time. Yet the world, in large measure, has grown so resistant, if not immune, to the actual words of Jesus Christ. In the Catholic tradition that I grew up with, the priest may go on to say, eternal life grant to them, O Lord. Yet there is less awareness and acceptance of the promise that Jesus actually made in his own words to those who believe in him. In the world I grew up in in New York City, which some tells me some tell me is not the center of the world, uh, it would be more commonplace to hear the words that I just read and here, this followed by a conversation of a celestial festival of some kind with our loved ones that we've lost being shown to their rooms in the great beyond. And when I was a young boy, my parents would haul my brother and I to what seemed to be weekly wakes and funerals for a variety of great aunts and uncles. What stuck with me, and how could it, how could it not, was the wailing and shrieking that was so prevalent during the wakes as well as the drama of a person throwing themselves across the casket. And sadly, I got to know many of the funeral directors because of our, our presence there so often. I was just a little kid. We spend so much of our waking lives chasing death away, and it becomes the ultimate boogeyman or bogeyman to be feared and avoided at all costs. And Hollywood has certainly contributed to this. Hollywood has generated millions and millions of dollars and perhaps more on the terror of death with, let's face it, hideous creatures capable of inflicting their worst. And then, switching gears, the ever-popular notional concept of the Teen Angst trilogy of vampire movies of the past decade or two, and these movies glamorized the mythical life of the undead, youthful bodies immune to aging, and no pain save for sunlight, perhaps. So, on one hand, we beat away death day in and day out in Hollywood's eyes, and then we welcome it as the classic beauty anti-aging anti regimen. This does not make any sense, of course, uh, nor does the thought that we die and enter into an endless dinner party with our beloved relatives and that they're somehow watching over the living, as is so often said of the departed. And all of us have heard that kind of a comment in our work setting or any social setting. Uh, and it sounds ridiculous when said, yet when I grew up with this, I, and I was not alone by any, any means to have heard that, the image was meant to be comforting. But when you think about it, it's at best quite creepy. And it's certainly not what God intends for us. So turn with me now to the truth that we receive in the Bible. And this is, in my view, the seminal truth offered by Paul to the Thessalonians. And this stemmed by a report that Timothy, provide, Timothy provided to Paul from the still new church in Thessalonica. One or more members had died, and the brethren were fretting about the, the future as they awaited the return of Jesus Christ. So reading together 
and again, still sticking in the NIV uh, version. And one First Thessalonians, excuse me, uh, chapter four and verses thirteen through eighteen. So again, four verses thirteen through eighteen. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now that sounds much more realistic and encouraging than someone telling me that someone is watching over me even now. And now I read this um, scripture at both my, of my parents' funeral services, which happened to be Catholic services. And I knew that I, what I had been taught in the past was incorrect, but my job was not to set those presents straight. Jesus instructs us to not fear death, that we will be with him when he returns, and that we are in dead, indeed asleep if we die prior to his return. Just as Jesus said to the family of Lazarus, he has fallen asleep. And also he, he repeated this uh, when he spoke to the father of a young girl in Matthew 9, verse 24. We don't need to turn there when he, he raised the little girl who had died. Prior to recent surgeries, I would get a paralyzing fear as they were preparing to put me out for six or so hour, hours. And the, the thought is, what if I don't wake up? It really frightened me. And I was not worried about the pain necessarily. I was fretting about not existing. Not that I would not know that I no longer existed, but that didn't seem comforting at that moment. For those six or more hours, I was simply asleep, but not asleep as you are at, at night when you're in that, that semi-sleeping, dreaming state. Um, you're just really completely gone. I was a dreamless state, unlike any normal sleep, as they say, and the next instant, I was aware of lights, fogginess, and the gentle noises of, of a room, a recovery room. My existence was, as I know, and is in the hands of God. And for further affirmation of our beliefs and our faith, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. And again, I'm still in NIV. I just felt like it was the more, um, uh, it offered some clarity that I wanted for this um, sermonette. In reading in, in um, verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So absolute clarity here for us. Then finally, in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5 and in verses 9 through 11, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Clearly, God does not want us to fear death. In fact, he commands that we not through our faith and our obedience in him. And if we do not believe some of the things the world would have us believe, the enemy would like us to fear because fear allows control and through control, dependence. Yet, as we always think of uh, John in, in chapter 14, and you do not need to turn here, it's just a point I want to make, as Jesus assures us, and this is really almost an admonition from Jesus to us. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Death is not a movie. It is part of our future, and then it will be no more. And we can rely on, on God for this promise.